Treasure Island, Chapter 5 The Loss of the Blind Man My curiosity, in a sense, was stronger than my fear, for I could not remain where I was, but crept back to the bank again, whence, sheltering my head behind the bushel broom, I might command the road before our door. I was scarcely in position when my enemies began to arrive, seven or eight of them, running hard, their feet beating out of time along the road, and the man with the lantern some paces in front. Three men ran together, hand in hand, and I made out, even through the mist, that the middle man of this three trio was the blind beggar. The next moment his voice showed me that I was right. Down with the door, he cried. Hey, hey, sir, answered two or three, and a rush was made upon the Admiral Benbow, the lantern bear following. And then I could see them pause, and hear speeches pass in a lower key, as if they were surprised to find the door open. But the pause was brief, for the blind man again issued his commands. His voice sounded loud and high, as if he were afire with eagerness and rage. In, 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 he shouted, and cursed them for their delay. Four or five of them obeyed at once, two remaining on the road with the formidable beggar. There was a pause, then a cry of surprise, and then a voice shouting from the house, Bill dead! But the blind man swore at them again for their delay. Search him, some of you shocking clubbers! And the rest of you are lost and get the chest, he cried. I could hear their feet rattling up our old stairs, so that the house must have shook with it. Promptly afterwards, fresh, fresh sounds of astonishment arose. The window of the captain's room was thrown open with a slam and a jingle of broken glass, and a man leaned out into the moonlight, head and shoulders, and addressed the blind beggar on the road below him. Pew! he cried. They've been before us! Someone's turned the chairs out, alone and aloft! Is it there? roared Pew. The money is there! The blind man cursed the money. Flynn's fist, I mean! he cried. You don't see it here, no how! returned the man. Here, you below there, is it on Bill? cried the blind man again. At that, another fellow, probably him who had remained below to search the captain's body, came to door. To the door of the inn. Bill's been overhauled already, said he. Nothing left. It's these people of the inn, it's that boy! I wish I had put his eye out! cried the blind man Pew. They were here no time ago. They had the door bolted when I tried it. Scatter lights and find them. Sure enough, they left their gleam here, said the fellow from the window. Scatter and find them. Root the house out, reiterated Pew, striking with his stick upon the road. When there followed a great to-do through the all our old inn, heavy feet pounding to and fro, Furniture thrown over, doors kicked in, until the very rocks reoccurred. They echoed, and the men came out again one after another on the road, and declared that we were nowhere to be found. And just then the same whistle that had alarmed my mother and myself over the dead captain's money was once more clearly audible through the night, but this time twice repeated. I had thought it to be the blind man's trumpet, so to speak, summoning his crew to their souls. But I now found that it was a signal from the hillside towards the hamlet, and from its effect upon the buccaneers a signal to warn them of approaching danger. There is a dig again, said one. Twice we'll have to bash mates. Bash you scout, cried Pew. Dirk was a fool and a coward. From the first, you wouldn't mind him. 
They must be close by. They can't be far. You have your hands on it. Scatter and look for them. Dogs. Or shiver my soul, I cried, if I had eyes. This appeal seemed to produce some effect, for two of the fellows began to look here and there among the lumbers. But half-heartedly, I thought, and with a half an eye to their own danger all the time, while the rest stood irresolute on the road. You have your hands on thousands, you fools, and you hang a leg. You would be as rich as kings if you could find it, and you know it's here. And you stand there skulking. There wasn't one of you dead face Bill, and I did. I blind the man, and I'm to lose my chance for you. I'm to be poor crawling beggar sponging for rum when I might be rolling in a coach. If you had the pluck of a weevil in a biscuit, you would catch them still. Hand give you, you we've got the doubloon, grunted one. They might have hid the blessed thing, said another. Take the George's pew, and don't stand here squalling. Squalling was the word for it. Pew's anger rose so high at these objections, till at last his passion completely taking the upper hand, he struck at them right and left in his blindness, and his stick sounded heavily on more than one. This, in their turn, cursed back at the blind miscreant, threatened him, in horrid tones, and tried in vain to catch the stick and wrest it from his grasp. This quarrel was the saving of us, for while it was still raging, another sound came from the top of the hill, on the side of the hamlet, the tramp of horses galloping. Almost at the same time, a pistol shot flash and report came from the hedge side. And that was plainly the last signal of danger, for the buccaneers turned at once and ran, separating in every direction. One seaward along the coast, one slant across the hill, and so on, so that in half a minute not a sign of them remained but Pew. Him they had deserted, whether in sheer panic or out of revenge for his ill words and blows, I know not. But there he remained behind, tapping up and down the road in a frenzy and groping and calling for his comrades. Finally, he took the wrong turn and ran a few steps past me towards the hamlet, crying, Johnny! Black Dog! Dog! And other names. He will not leave all pew, mate, not all pew! Just then the noise of horses stopped the rise and four or five riders came inside in the moonlight and swept at full gallop down the slope. At this, Pew saw his error, turned with a scream and ran straight for the ditch into which he rolled. But he was on his feet again in a second and made another dash, now utterly bewildered, right under the nearest of the coming horses. The rider tried to save him, but in vain, down went Pew with a cry that rang high into the night, and the four hoofs trampled and spurned him and passed by. He fell on his side, then gently collapsed on, upon his face and moved no more. I leaped to my feet and held the riders. They were pulling up at any rate, horrified at the accident, and I soon saw what they were. One tailing out behind the rest was a lad that had gone from the hamlet to Dr. Livesey's. The rest were revenue officers whom he had met by the way, and with whom he had had the intelligence to return at once. Some news of the lager in his hall had found its way to supervisor Dunn, and set him forth that night in our direction, and to that circumstance my mother and I owed our preservation from that. Pew was dead, stone dead. As for my mother, when I cried, when he had carried her up to the hamlet, a little cold water and salt, and that soon brought her back again. And she was not the worse for her terror, though she still continued to deplore the balance of the money. In the meantime, the supervisor rode on as fast as he could, 
to kiss Hall. But his men had to dismount and rope down the dingle, leading and sometimes supporting their horses and in continual fear of ambushes. So it was no great matter for surprise that when they got down to the hall, the lager was already on the way, though still closed in. He heard her. A voice replied, telling him to keep out of the moonlight, moonlight, or he would get some lead in him, and at the same time a bullet whistled close by his arm. Soon after, the lugger doubled the point and disappeared. Mr. Dunn stood there, as he said, like a fish out of water, and all he could do was to dispatch a man to be, to warn the cutter. And that, said he, is just about as good as nothing. They've got off clean, and there's an end only, he ended, ended, added. I'm glad I trod on Master Spew's corn. By this time he, he had heard my story. I went back with him to the Admiral Benbow, and you cannot imagine a house in such a state of smash. The very clock had been thrown down by these fellows in their furious hunt after my mother and myself. And though nothing had actually been taken away except the captain's money back and a little silver from the till, I could see at once that we were ruined. Mr. Downs could make nothing of the sense. They got the money, you say? Well then, Hawkins, what in fortune were they after? No money, I suppose? No, sir, no money, I think, replied I. In fact, sir, I believe I have them think in my breast pocket. And to tell you the truth, I should like to get it put in a safety. To be sure, boy, quite right, said he. I'll take it if you like. I thought perhaps Dr. Lucy, I begin. Perfectly right, he interrupted very cheerily. Perfectly right, a gentleman and a magistrate. And now, I come to think of it, I might as well write round there myself and report to him, Esquire. Must have used that. Uh, when all is done, not that I regret it, but he is dead, you see, and people will make it out against an officer of his majesty's revenue, if make it out they can. Now, I'll tell you, Hawkins, if you like, I'll take you along. I thank him heartily for the officer, for the offer, and we walked back to the hamlet, where the horses were. By the time I had told my mother of my purpose, they were all in the saddle. Dogger, said uh, Mr. Dunn. You have a good horse. Take up this lad behind you. As soon as I was mounted, holding on to Dogger's belt, the supervisor gave the word, and the party struck out at a bouncing trot on the road to Dr. Lisi's house.